All right, so here's, here's what I'd like to do with you today. Uh, Lola, Lola mentioned to you that I do have a bit of history in, in what we might call community interpreting, but these days I think of myself primarily as a conference interpreter. And the, the nice parlor trick that we conference interpreters get to do is simultaneous. I'm aware from the ties that I still have with community interpreters that there's increasing pressure on you to do simultaneous in your settings too. We see this, well we always have seen this in the legal setting, especially if you're interpreting at the defense table, you're having to do a whispered simultaneous. But we're hearing more and more about court settings that want to have the equipment to provide simultaneous. And the big change, I think, that we're starting to see is in the healthcare setting as well. We're starting to see patient education seminars, for example, that people are wanting to have interpreted simultaneously. The big problem that we've been talking about here today is that there very often is a lack of training opportunities for community interpreters. So the bad news is, if you need to work in simultaneous, you're on your own. The good news is that I have a couple of ideas on what you can be doing if you're disciplined. A couple of ideas on what you've been doing if you are ready to engage in self-training. And that's what I want to do with you here today. I want to present a couple of ideas that you might implement on your own time to be starting to build your skills for simultaneous. So if it is all up to me, how can I get good at simultaneous? I'm going to look at this with you by talking to you about a few things here today. First off, I'm going to lay some ground rules for speech making. I'm going to assume that most of what you have to do is monologic in nature. I know that what I mean by that is one person talking for an extended period of time, what you might have in a patient education seminar. There's somebody at the front of the room giving a talk saying, so you've been newly diagnosed as diabetic, for example, um, here's how you manage your new chronic condition. I know that some of the settings where you're needing to do simul are more dialogic, in other words, there are people having a conversation, like in mental health, when things start to get a little bit hairy. Um, but you know what, I think that dialogic interpreting, at least in SIMO, is a little bit beyond what we can do today, so we're going to focus on the monologic. Monologic means a speech, a talk that somebody's giving. So we're going to focus on a couple of rules for speech making. We're going to talk about some criteria for judging the quality of simultaneous. And then I have a couple of ideas for you, a couple of practical exercises we're going to do together. We're going to talk about how you can bridge the distance first from consecutive to simultaneous. We're going to talk about the value of repetition, and then I'll leave you with some parting thoughts. So today, we are going to engage in some speech making. And here I'm going to make a nod to my colleague, Helen Campbell, because this is largely inspired by her example, and we'll be hearing from Helen a little bit later on. But when we are trying to come up with practice material for ourselves, we're trying to come up with speech material, it's important that we do a few things when we're making a speech. We want to talk about a topic. We're going to introduce a topic. We're going to introduce it with a personal connection. One of the most difficult things about simultaneous is the fact that when people give a talk, they take on, they embody different people in the talk. Sometimes I, as a speaker, might be talking about myself, my own opinions, or I might say that earlier today we heard from Lola who said, I'm really glad to have you here today. I just became, I just became, uh, figuratively speaking, Lola for a moment. So I was voicing Lola's words. In the, in the thrust of simultaneous, it can be very difficult to separate out those personalities. So that's why we introduce a little bit of a personal connection to the topic, we're going to throw in a few facts and figures to, to start to challenge ourselves a little bit, and then we'll give a speech with a personal connection and a close. So this is the model that we're going to use in our speech making <coughs> today. I'm going to talk to you as well a little bit very briefly, just setting some ground rules with you. How do we judge quality? How do we know whether we're doing a good job when we're interpreting in simultaneous? Uh, a, a teacher of mine once said, anybody can do simultaneous, it's easy to do simultaneous, what's hard is, is doing it well. So how do we know when we're doing it well? 
Sometimes my students, when I listen to them in the booth, they'll say things like, I'm so very glad to be with you here today, and another thing I want to <laughs> say is that I really wonder if anybody else is going to come through that door. <laughs> that is not a normal pace of delivery. What we want to try and do is be neither too slow nor too fast. Um, and to pause, as you've seen here in number three, pause <coughs> where uh, it's, it's appropriate to do so. The, the second point that I want to make in talking about quality is that we need to be thinking about what it's like to listen to us, uh, what it's like to be the client of a simultaneous interpreter all day long. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a conference in Taiwan. And I went to the conference, I was the only English speaker there. And so I gave, a, I gave my talk, but then the rest of the day was in Chinese. Now, I don't understand a word of Chinese, so I was dependent on the interpretation. I had wonderful interpreters, they were very talented, and I could understand everything that was going on that day thanks to the interpreters. I was really uh, depending on them for dear life. But let me tell you, by the end of the day, I was exhausted, completely exhausted, I felt as though I myself had interpreted five days in a row without sleep. I think it was actually harder to be the client uh, than it is to be the interpreter. So we need to be thinking about what it means to be listening to us all day long. And if, like me, when you're in front of an audience, you have a tendency to have the pitch of your voice go up the way mine is now, and you become aware of that, you need to settle it back down into the mid-range of your register, and every once in a while, just to uh, give a little bit of razzle-dazzle to your client, you're going to drop it even further down. <laughs> Particularly when you reach the end of the sentence. <laughs> so we need to have control over our voices and recognize when we're in the upper range, when we're in our mid-range, and when we're dropping it down even further. So those are three easy criteria. Are we having a normal pace, nothing too fast, nothing too slow? Are we in control of our voice, and are we pausing in between sentences rather than in the middle of them. Those are just some easy criteria that we'll use today. All right, so here's what I'd like to do. I'm already gonna jump into our first exercise together, and I'm going to need to rely on a little bit of technology here, so bear with me for a moment as I get myself set up. All right, so in just one moment, I'm going to give you a speech, and what I'd like you to do uh, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse because we're going to learn about note-taking after this. But what I'd like you to do is take some notes on the speech. I'm going to give you a speech that's very short, it's two minutes in length. I'm going to give you a, uh, a speech that's two minutes in length. I'm going to try and record myself as well. When the speech is over, I'm going to call a couple of victims, I mean volunteers, up to the front. <laughs> And I'm going to ask them to interpret my speech consecutively. And for, for the sake of ease, because we have so many different languages, uh, I, we'll do this English to English. Then afterwards, uh, if I, my recording has turned out, then I'll simply play the recording with an earpiece for somebody, and they'll shadow it back to us. And we'll, we can see whether we've got the three, uh, the three items that I suggested were measures of quality uh, for us. All right. So are we ready? Do you think, do you have a notepad or some paper at the ready, a pen in your hand, and you're prepared to take uh, some notes? If that's the case, then I'm going to begin my speech now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you today about AIDS and HIV. Um, you may be looking at the, the gray hairs that are on my face and recognizing perhaps that when I was an adolescent, uh, the HIV academic, epidemic rather, was in full swing. As a teenager, I learned all about the importance of safe sex, and some of the people that I knew at the time uh, who contracted HIV are now, unfortunately, no longer with us. If you became HIV positive at that point in time, it was pretty much a death sentence. In the mid-1990s, this changed. This changed because of something that's known as the cocktail. Basically, uh, scientists figured out if you, if you gave multiple medicines 
to an HIV patient, we could keep the replication of HIV in check. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about the three kinds of medications that normally make up an HIV cocktail. The first of these has a very long name, but we can just call it the NUCS. It stands for something called non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, but <laughs> we'll call it NUCS. We'll call them the NUCS. Basically, they stop DNA, uh, they stop the, the virus from replicating itself by fooling around with its DNA. There's another very similar class of drugs called non-nukes. They work in very much the same way as the nukes. And then finally, there's something called a protease inhibitor. When you take all three of these medications together, then you can effectively control HIV. As a matter of fact, by popping one pill today that combines all three medications, uh, we don't have a cure, but we do have control for what is essentially now a chronic disease. And there you have it. That is my speech. Oh, great speech. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was the speech. That was the speech. Let me just go back here. Did you think, do you think that it conformed to this framework? Yes. Yes? Yes. Was there an introduction to the topic? Yes. What was the introduction? No, I'm Okay, I want one hand up. Can somebody think that they can identify the introduction? So over here, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to talk about HIV. Okay, so a skimpy bit of an introduction, but an introduction nevertheless. Yes. <laughs> I only had two minutes after all. Um, was there a personal connection to the topic? Your yes. face. Yes. My face. What else? <laughs> Sorry, I've got multiple voices. I'm going to pick one at a time. Orestes, please. You can see the gray hair growing on my face. And I remember when I was growing up in the 1980s, AIDS was very common. And some people who are not with us because they died. Because of AIDS. Absolutely. Okay, so do we have, we have that personal connection. A few facts and figures? Yeah, it is. So, Elena, do you want to tell us the facts and figures? Uh, he was saying, well, before the, the facts and figures, he said people like knew back then with HIV. Um, they, yeah. they would not be able to say the death of a sentence for them because there was no cure on the children and they are no longer. Sure. Uh, then we get into the nitty gritty of things. <laughs> So that was the 1990s, but now we get into, I'm sorry, what's your name? Carmelina. 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 Um, so after the 1990s, age changed because of something called the cocktail. Yes. Can anybody tell us about the cocktail? Yes. So I want hands up so, so to avoid all of the talking at one time. I'm going to pick somebody in the, in the middle here. Oh, at the back. Yeah, and what are they? Protease inhibitors. Okay, fantastic. Was there a, I maybe skipped the personal connection at the end, but was there a close? Yes. Currently we have no cure, but we have control. Okay. So with that now reviewed and fresh in our minds, I want a volunteer to come up here and from their notes give us a consecutive of this. Which is to repeat what you said. To repeat. So not simultaneous just yet, we're going to get to that in a moment. But somebody just to read off their notes and give the speech the way I gave it, or as close to that as you can get. Sure. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk to you today about the AIDS and HIN. You might see the gray hair on my face, but um, when I was an adolescent, the, the disease was in full swing. Therefore, I learned everything about safe sex. And lots of the people I knew who 
contracted the disease at the time are no longer with us today, but at the time getting HIV was a death sentence for sure. But then we came to the mid-90s and everything changed thanks to something that was called the cocktails. The scientific, scientists actually figured out how to keep the HIV in check. And uh, I'm going to review with you the medical um, cocktail that is called there was one called the nukes, which is nuclear and, and uh, something inhibitor, that actually stopped <laughs> the virus by, by fooling around with its DNA. Another one called non nuts and another one called the protease inhibitor. When taken together, these three medications would control the virus of the HIV, and nowadays by popping only one single pill, that contains the three medications in control to what is now called a chronic disease. So we've got a demonstration of how to handle this in consecutive. And I'm not surprised that people in this room are dealing well with consecutive. This is, if you do any interpretation at all, this is probably the mode in which you work most often. Now that we're a little bit familiar with the content of this speech, let's see if we can do it in simultaneous. So I just checked here, and my recording did take, I think, probably relatively well. And the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like another victim uh, volunteer to come, <laughs> come up here in the front. We'll put the earpiece on them, and we'll see if they can do, this time it'll be a bit of shadowing, we're just working English to English, um, and we'll see if they can manage that, particularly since we've now been through the content of this a couple of times. Is there somebody who would like to give this a try? Just a little bit of shadowing, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> The HIV academic was in full swing. As a teenager, I, I know all about the importance of safe sex. Some of the people um, uh, who didn't pay attention at the time was no longer with us. If we talked about, if we are tested positive HIV, uh, then it's the same as death sentence. At the mid 1990s, this changed. This changed because of something known as as the cocktail. Basically, scientists have figured out if you give multiple medicines to uh, HIV patient, it can uh, keep uh, the application intact. Let's uh, talk briefly about the kind of uh, medicine uh, the, that makes up the uh, cocktail, medical cocktail. It has a long name, just we just uh, call it uh, news. Yes, uh, called it uh, uh, non nukes uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Just call it nukes. Let's call it nukes. This stuff, DNA, this stuff, the virus environment replicated itself by fooling around uh, with this DNA. There's another really similar, uh, similar kinds of drugs called non nukes, uh, which uh, works in, uh, very much the same way, and uh, the, another called gradient uh, inhibitor. When you take all these three medicines together, then you can, uh, you can effectively control HIV. As a matter of fact, by uh, you know, talking to the cure today, that contain uh, one, we do not have a cure uh, of, that can control what is in short in a uh, chronic disease. And that is, uh, you have it, that is my speech. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about quality. These are my criteria for quality. How did our colleague do? So first of all, I'm going to ask the colleague, because one of the things that's always important is to assess yourself. How do you think you did compared to these three criteria? 
uh, in terms of the first one, normal pace, um, yeah, uh, fair, uh, but uh, can be better. Uh, keep control of the voice, upload, yeah, that, that's uh, also fair. Pause when it's appropriate in between. Still not very good, but it's <laughs> good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, what I'm not satisfied with is uh, I lost something because so you know the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can feel that. Any other thoughts on quality, Martin? Yeah, well, I actually thought for those three criteria, I think the, the pace seems normal to me, and he had good control of his voice, and I felt like he, he made some appropriate pauses. I still felt that there was some content loss here and there, like with the catch, but for those three criteria. I think Okay. Well, over here. I think he met that pretty much there. He, he did good. And it's something I struggle with is the ums, uh, mm, uh, 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 and that's a distractor to me. That when I listen to someone with the uh, uh, you know, that it's very distracting. So I'm very conscious of that. So that's why I mention it. Thank you. Elena? Um, I also noticed that some parts kind of went uh, full swing with his pace and voice, but then somehow he would go up and down. Some of the thoughts, uh, some of the things were said, and somebody was heard along with his breath because he was trying to catch up and also listen to what exactly was being said. So I, I found that fluctuation a little bit. Sure. <clears throat> when we're doing our own practice, that's where number two comes into play, I think. We're trying to find a way. Yes, when we speed up, maybe we will we will fall under our own breath. We'll start to mumble a little bit. But that's when we need to get control over the voice again. One of the reasons why I had you use a system that only has one earpiece was to mimic what conference interpreters tend to do when they're working in a booth situation. We have a headset that has two sides to it, but we typically slide one earpiece off so that we're listening to what's coming in, but we're listening to ourselves as well. So if you're monitoring yourself, then you can be paying attention to, am I starting to mumble my voice really good? Okay, now I'll get control over my voice again. Don't worry if you can't do this the first time around. Very few of us can. Very few of us have the presence of mind to control all of these things. I'll often tell my students that wait until you have a blue sky moment. And by that I mean, initially, simultaneous seems massively confusing. How many people here have uh, learned to drive a car on a standard transmission? Yes? Tell me if you have this experience, you stop at a red light when you're learning to drive and the red light is on an incline. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing already because you know what comes next. Right? The light turns green and you're supposed to do something with the left hand, the right hand, the right, left foot and the right foot and you can't figure it all out. <laughs> And what happens when the light turns green? You might stall, or because you're on an incline, you might start rolling back, such as into the grill of a Mack truck, the way Andrew did his first time behind the wheel. <laughs> so that's what happens when we start, that's what it feels like. But eventually, with enough practice, what happens later on when you learn to drive? Have you had this experience? You leave work or some place that you go to habitually and you're on your way home and you're thinking about the day that's been and oh, so and so said this to me and I really should have said that back to them and next Saturday, what am I going to do with the kids and did I take the, the dog out for a walk and blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, you're at your own home. And you say to yourself, I have no idea how I got here. Right? And that's because the process of driving has become so automatic that you don't need to consciously think about it. You can shift your attention, hopefully not for too long, but, but shift your attention to other things. And this is what happens when we practice simultaneous interpreting. Some of the processes become more automatic, and we suddenly have resources freed up to be thinking about things like, how do I sound to my clients? And when you have that blue sky moment, the clouds part, you can suddenly see the sky, a beam of sunshine comes down from on high. Maybe you have that extra moment where you can say, where's my, oh, okay, I'm just going to drop that back down again. One other thing that I'm going to point out for you very quickly is uh, at one point, and we heard, we heard our colleague actually repeat me exactly as I said this, I started talking about DNA and then I stopped myself halfway through the sentence and I recast the sentence. And I said it stops the virus from replicating, uh, from recreating its DNA. 
And he followed me down the rabbit hole and repeated the bit of sentence that I started and never finished. This is one instance where I would argue monologic interpretation, at very least in something like a patient education seminar, is different from either a legal setting or a diagnostic setting. In, in a patient education seminar, when you're interpreting, the patient is not trying to diagnose the, the dietician at the front of the room and say, oh, that was a false start. I wonder if all her cognitive faculties are in place. <laughs> this is not mental health. We're not trying to reach a diagnostic. We're not trying to establish her credibility like in a court of law. And so for the benefit of your client, who's having to listen to you all day, you can drop the false start. And then all of a sudden, you get closer to a normal pace, you start to reassert some of that control. So the bits that are fluff, that don't mean anything, the I just want to, no, hang on a second, no, I, what's the best, oh, this is how I'm going to say it. You can drop that for the benefit of your client. All right. I've got 15, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. So here's what I'd like you to do. I would like you to find a partner. If you have a partner who speaks your language, that would be super fantastic. If you don't, we can manage that as well. We can do this simply English to English. We are going to have one of the partners give a two-minute speech. Um, if we can't uh, record, that's fine. If some of you have a smartphone and can record yourself, that's great. If you can't, just we'll do the speech twice off of the notes and you'll just whisper it into the ear of the person. So partner A is going to devise a short speech, and I have an outline for you in just one second that should help you. You're going to talk for two minutes. Partner B is going to take notes. At the end of the two minutes, we're going to repeat the speech, either from a recording if you have a smartphone, or you can just read the same speech again to, the, to partner B, whisper it into their ear, and they can do sort of a whispered simultaneous back to you. And then we'll do it, uh, so you'll be doing it once consecutively, once simultaneously. I don't know if we'll have time to switch and, and play the other roles, but we do it one way, one round through that way. Here's what I'd like you to do. Here's a bit of, a, here's a bit of an outline. I want you to talk about scoliosis. You can't read that very well, but let me walk you through it. How many people had this experience when they were growing up? In primary school, you had to line up one day you had to put on, take most of your clothes off and put a gown on and then you'd line up one by one as a doctor asked you to bend over and he checked your back and do you have scoliosis. Anybody have that experience in school? Really? <laughs> oh my goodness. I must, have, I must have gone to some strange school. Did you ever go to the doctor? They had you take your shirt off as a child, and you had to bend over so that the doctor could manually, uh, physically examine your spine and see whether you have scoliosis. Okay, Elena understands me. So Elena has the personal connection to the topic, as do I. Scoliosis, as I've said here, is the sideways curvature of the spine. It can be treated in one of three ways, through physiotherapy, bracing, or surgery. So physiotherapy, we just try to, to work the muscles on the other side to balance out the curve of the spine. Bracing, you actually put a device on the student, or on the child rather, so that they have to stand up straight and try to work out the, the bend in the spine. Or surgery, obviously, the most invasive technique. Treatments are usually effective. Um, if it's detected early enough, that's why in primary school we had to line up and go through this exam, at least in my school. And uh, all the pain is worth it because um, because if you, you get it early enough, you detect it early enough, you can do something about it. So that's the gist of the speech. Are you clear on what you need to do next? Do you have a partner? Yes. Is somebody feeling ready to try a two-minute speech on this topic? I see a hand up with a question over here. Okay, hold, hold the talking just a second for, so we can hear the question. Why didn't you do it right after lunch? Uh, is that right? Well, I'm, I, I've tried the same argument with my clients. Why do you have to ask me to interpret after lunch? And they don't buy that very much. Either. All right, so I'm going to give you two minutes on the clock. I gave a short speech based on this framework to your partner. Have the partner take notes. Away you go. <laughs>
She has a pen. I'm going to stop you there. I just want to take your pulse. I just want to take your pulse for a second. So can we just listen for a moment? There we go. I'm hoping that at least some of you in the room gave a two-minute speech. One partner gave a two-minute speech. The other partner took notes. Put your hands up, please, if you managed to accomplish that. Okay. So here's what I want you to do next. If you have a recording device, use it. Otherwise, partner A gives the same speech back. And you're going to do either a simultaneous, if you have the same language pair, or if you don't, you can just shadow it. But partner A is sort of going to whisper into the ear of partner B. This is the time when you want to pop a Tic Tac. <laughs> and partner B can look at their notes that they took the first time around and shadow or interpret. Is that clear? Okay, hang on. Hang on, we got a question. Hang on. Hang on one second. There's a question on the floor. Yeah, the question is partner A to shadow the uh, how would I know uh, what to tell if I already delivered this speech without taking notes myself? <laughs> so the question is, how do I remember, if I'm partner A giving the speech a second time, how do I remember what I said the first time around? <laughs> and that's where short-term memory, my friends, comes in handy for interpreters. Hopefully you took a couple of notes, and the, the outline is still up here on, on the... Screen. So away you go, two minutes to try this. Yeah, because you're used to 
subtext will give the short term memory yakking is not the same as yeah. if I was to hear this for the first time. Okay. I want to see fatal so the key word in the colleague's response to me was anticipate. And this is what, at least as a conference interpreter, this is why I prepare beforehand. I go, get documentation, do research on my own, try to have as much of a command of the topic matter as I can reasonably have so that I'm in good shape in the booth the next day. So that I can anticipate what people are going to say. Do you ever get copies of the speech beforehand that you can study the actual speech? So the question was, do you ever get a copy of the speech? Yes. Sometimes. Sometimes not. It depends on the client. So again, we try to document ourselves as best we can so that we have that anticipation factor working in our behalf. How can I handle the situation when I, when I lost one word and the meaning of that word is key word in that interpretation? So the question was, Andrew, what if I miss something that's an essential element? If I don't catch that bit, I don't understand some key part. Happens to us all the time. When we start off, simultaneous doesn't feel simultaneous. It feels like we're switching back and forth. Sometimes I'm listening to the original, sometimes I'm listening to myself. With more practice, you actually get to divide your attention. So how do you recover? You recover by doing more practice and having a good command of the skill set before you try doing this for clients. Any other thoughts? What will you take away from this exercise? We need practice. You need practice, absolutely. Because time is running out, I just want to at least explain something else that you could do. So what I've been saying is, how do you develop a springboard to bounce high enough to reach Simo territory? One springboard is to simply do material in consecutive and then try that same material again in simultaneous. Another springboard is repetition. Repetition. Uh, try speech material that's within your level or that's at your level of difficulty. And if you're not satisfied with your performance on it, do it again. And if you're not satisfied with the performance on it, do it again. <laughs> you're sensing a theme here, I, I take it. So that's another tool that you can use at home. Create speech material for yourself, use the consecutive to Simo Springboard, or do repetition. All right, a couple of parting thoughts. If you were, if you've been practicing at home and thinking, here comes here comes an assignment that's reasonably within my ability to offer a professional level service. You get the phone call, you say, yeah, I've done, I've done diabetes, for example, diabetes education a million times in consecutive. I've been practicing my simultaneous. I think I'm ready to go into the hospital and to do this in the simultaneous mode. You get the phone call, you accept the gig, what do you do to prepare beforehand? How do you prepare to go into that setting? Uh, first of all, get, get a little bit of sleep before. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So sometimes my students will come to me and say, Ah, I have a big, a big uh, test the next day you're going to administer to us. How do I prepare? I should stay up late and, uh, practicing, practicing, practicing. No. I go to bed. Get some sleep. You can't do this unless you're rested and uh, feeling at the top of your game. What else would you do? Eat, eat your breakfast, absolutely. Get a little bit of energy. Nothing worse than having that energy crash while you're in the middle of interpreting. At the back of the room. Uh, when I'm watching a movie or TV, I try to do some of the I would caution you on that. The, the thought was, I'll, I'll, I'll do simo uh, while watching TV. Very often, a news broadcaster, for example, is speaking at an incredible clip. And especially for, well, I don't even think I would try to, to interpret the news, to be perfectly honest, because that's, that's not realistic, that's not the setting that I'm going to work in, and the speed, these are people who are trained to speak clearly and communicate ideas very, very quickly. I, I wouldn't suggest that. There are many clips, clips have 
Yeah, there is a medical a colleague saying we have a medical website. There's also something out there that has speech material at a very realistic level. It's called Speech Pool. It was put together by a colleague in the UK who's now with the European Commission. So Speech Pool, like the pool that you dive into. You can Google that. Register for it, and then you'll find speech material there. They also have a Facebook page. So if there's material you would like to have, something more on the medical side of things, for example, or with a given language pair, you can put in that request via, uh, via the Facebook page. And now, because my time is up, I'm just going to leave you with an absolutely shameless plug. <laughs> Next Saturday, if we have whet your appetite in any way, next Saturday between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., the Master of Conference Interpreting is having an open house. So you can come to Glendon College, you can visit us in our new lab, we have a couple of events that we've scheduled, you can listen to the, inter the students interpret, you can sit down in the booth yourself and try your hand at a little bit of SIMO if you should feel so inclined, and we'll be on hand to answer questions like, do I really want to take classes with that Clifford jerk? <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you walked away.